think it's office it's that you're duty, so there's a couple yeah, people still in there. Yeah, it's and it's other warm side. In there, if, if you want to grab them now, or if you want to just make sure to grab them before I have a key to the main office, too. I can get them in there if we need to. You have a key? Not the chair's office, but the main A office. Okay, we'll leave them in the main office if okay. they're still there. Okay. Whatever. Okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Argentina project. 
So for those artists familiar, um, here's the Andes, here in central Argentina, and there's a small mesoscale mountain range called the Sierras de Cordoba. And in this region, for a long time, from satellite data and you know reports from the ground from people who live there, we suspect that some of the most intense storms in the world occur in this region. So the question is why, and how do we do better at predicting them? And what can learning about the processes in this region tell us about the extreme end of convection that we can understand on a more global scale? So a couple years ago, uh, we went down there with a suite of instrumentation, including a lot of radars, aircraft, soundings, um, and other mobile facilities to try to get a handle on um, the initiation of scale growth and production of very large hail in this area. So this hail actually fell um, in a small mountain town of Misha Colors Pass where we had our operations center. Um, and you know, for those who aren't familiar with looking at radar data, this is range, this is height. Um, and what we saw from the ground was what we suspected from a lot of satellite data in terms of the intensity of this rainfall and, and these storms. And what makes this also special is compared to the US, which is what a lot of people will think of when thinking about severe weather, these storms grow um, upscale into mesoscale convective systems, typically at a much faster rate than we see in the US. So a lot of my research right now is understanding why. And it's the combination of looking at the role of topography, the environmental conditions, in particular, um, my student that's um, still back at Washington um, just published on some new insights about the South American low-level jet in this region. And then we're taking that a step further to understand its control and relationship with the topography and the rapid upscale growth in this region. And then my uh, student here, Anthony Crespo, actually on Monday, he's heading back down to Argentina to take a look at all of the hailstones that's been collected from the citizen science network um, in the region, start cutting them open, mulling them down, and trying to understand the chemistry and physical characteristics of the hailstones and related to that some of the modeling that's being done in this region. So we're kind of all across the board here. We're thinking about severe weather um, in Argentina. All right, moving back to Taiwan, I mentioned that as a grad student, I was there to look at precipitation, and we we're supposed to head back there in 2020, and then last year, and fingers crossed, we're going this May, um, <laughs> just got word that the quarantine might be reduced, so we might actually get there this year. Um, but it is a natural laboratory for studying severe weather. For those who haven't looked in this area, extreme rainfall, it takes extreme rainfall to an extreme that we don't necessarily see in this region of the world. And this is a, another mountainous region um, where we are looking into the ingredients of rainfall, both near and away from the terrain. There are some situations where the most intense rainfall falls on the coast. Others are really controlled by the topography. And a lot of times when we think of this duration intensity rainfall spectrum, uh, moisture is often a limiting factor when we think about extreme rainfall that's the US. Here, it's not so much of an issue. So we're thinking about some of the other ingredients that may control the variability of rainfall. So this is a joint project uh, with Japan and South Korea. Um, the instruments have changed depending on the year. So we're still getting ready to ship the radars and it's a few weeks and hope for the best. Um, but really we want to understand some of the, the common um, ingredients, but really what makes it unique when we get some of the most extreme rainfall. So graduate student Ian Cornu here at the University of uh, here, here at, at this department um, he was supposed to go in the field, but since we haven't been able to go in the field, we've been using operational data um, from a previous extreme rainfall case in Taipei um, and using um, high resolution war simulations, um, modifying the topography to try to understand how it's playing a role in previous events and we'll get some better data, um, you know, this summer. So I wanted to bring that up um, just very quickly because we couldn't go into the field. There's a suite of um, radars that are sitting along the front range of Colorado that we largely operated remotely last summer. Like we need to get something. And this is kind of a nice database to compare against what we're going to collect next year. So we had a few local students um, launch some sounding. We spent most of last summer taking turns sitting at a radar here from Madison um, or the computer operating some of the radars. And we were looking at the flash flooding events over the burn scars that happened last year on the Colorado. So we've got, we're sitting on this data set now that we can compare a bit to what we're going to collect, hopefully this year. And then finally, um, another project that was supposed to happen in 2020, it has happened last year, and we're going to go out and finish it this year. Um, it's an airborne project sponsored by NASA, 
where it's a unique opportunity to look at the three dimensional structure of tropical oceanic convection from radar. And the unique aspect is we also have a, a Doppler wind LIDAR on the aircraft. So we can get wind very close to the convection. This is really unique. So um, graduate student Ben Roddenkirk is looking at um, an earlier campaign that, that had some of this data set um, in the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico, understanding these relationships between the convective systems and the near storm environment. And then August or September, or whenever they decide we're going back out, um, hopefully this summer, um, and focusing on the intertropical convergence zone off of what goes to Who I know a lot, uh, but that's, I'm really interested in these sort of data sets. COVID has made this really challenging. Um, but we're still able to get some interesting data. And honestly, it's going to make the field campaign even better because we've had more time to test to drag run. For this project, I'll just end with this. This project was really cool because it was disappointing that we couldn't go out at first, but we did virtual flights through model data to try to see how we could fine tune our flight strategies. Um, so again, you know, make the best out of a tough situation. We're sitting with all of that experience now to be going into the field. All right, that's all I have. Thanks. So uh, next we have uh, Professor Kristen Lequier. The button on the south person will unmute it. Okay. Perfect. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll do the same thing as Angela, uh, just give you a little bit of a background about who I am. So I've been a professor in the atmospheric and oceanic sciences department since 2011. Um, I actually did my undergraduate and my master's degree in physics at Dalhousie University, which is in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Uh, then I went to Colorado State, and actually I knew Angela very well while we were there. Um, we overlapped for some, quite some time, uh, both as a PhD student and then also uh, eventually as a um, research scientist there. And a lot of the research I'm going to show you today uh, sort of has evolved from the work that I started at Colorado State. Um, so I'm going to do the same thing uh, that Angela did. I'm going to give you a real quick overview of a few of the projects that I'm working on. Um, there, there's quite a bit of synergy actually between what Angela does and what I do. Um, I do a lot of work uh, on remote sensing of the atmosphere but using satellite observations and actually one of the satellites that I use a lot and I used in my PhD is a radar, it's just a radar in space, uh, that's the CloudSat satellite here, uh, which is part of this A train of satellites, it's a constellation of five, or was it 1.6 satellites. Um, and now it's since sort of uh, fallen apart a little bit with cloud and Calypso dropping out of this. But for about 10 years, we had this kind of unprecedented view of the atmosphere from multiple perspectives with multiple instruments. And so a lot of my research stems, uh, or stems from the fact that we put this constellation together and focuses on using the information from these satellites to understand climate processes. And from there, try to improve the way we um, model the climate and hopefully improve climate project projections. Um, so a couple of the instruments that are really important here to the research uh, that I do, uh, Ceres measures top of the atmosphere radiative fluxes. Calypso uh, is a LIDAR in space that measures thin cloud and aerosol properties. CloudSat, as I said, um, one of my main focuses uh, is a radar. It measures cloud pro uh, profiles and precipitation. And then there's um, wide swath instruments like MODIS and the AMSR E. Um, MODIS is a visible and infrared radiometer. Uh, AMSR E is a microwave radiometer that measures cloud properties and precipitation. And so, one of the things that my group does a lot of is trying to synthesize all this information to understand the role that clouds and aerosols and precipitation are playing in the climate system. Here's one example of some research that a PhD student. Alex Mattis um, of mine did a few years ago, where we use these new sensors and combine all the information they provide to understand the frequency of occurrence of different cloud types. And just in a very simple classification, clouds that are made up of ice, clouds that are made up of liquid, clouds that have both liquid and ice phase in them, that those are individual clouds that have both phases, 
and then clouds that are made up of distinct liquid and ice layers. And what we found is using these new sensors um, that mixed phase clouds, which are very difficult to detect using any one of these sensors by themselves, make up about 8% of the cloud cover globally. And clouds that are made up of distinct liquid and ice layers actually account for about a quarter of the clouds um, that you see around the globe at any given time. So it's, it's a pretty significant uh, finding that these, these two very difficult to measure um, cloud regimes actually occur very frequently. And then I mentioned radiation measurements and the impact on climate. Uh, so one of the things we did is then extrapolated this to estimate what the impact of these clouds are on the surface and top of the atmosphere, surface and top of the atmosphere radiation balance. Um, so this, these are maps of the annual average impact of all of these different cloud types. And I just want to point out, if you focus on the little pink box here, these mixed phase clouds that make up about 8% of total cloud cover are actually responsible for about 20% of the net cloud radiative effect at both the top of the atmosphere and, at the, sur and the surface. So these are a very important cloud type and one that was not really accessible before the A-train um, to do this kind of estimate. Um, I wanted to, again, kind of shift gears a little bit here and talk about another somewhat related topic, and that is using satellite observations to understand the radiative effect of convective systems on the climate. So this is just shifting gears into convection. Uh, this is work that's being done by Juliet Kaluski, who's a current PhD student in my group, um, and a couple of snapshots of a uh, paper that we just submitted to the Journal of Geophysical Research, where we're using cloud side observations and Thank you, Angela, for introducing what this figure shows. Uh, this is the height latitude cross section of radar reflectivity through a convective system. This is a single core cloud, um, convective system observed by CloudSat, and this is a multi core amalgamation of a lot of different convection, uh, convective um, updrafts in a very big system that runs from zero to you know, 25 degrees latitude, so a 2,500 kilometer stretch of convection. And what we're doing is analyzing the impacts of these, both on precipitation, but also on the radiation um, globally, and comparing the radiative impacts of single core systems from multi-core systems, uh, also trying to use geostationary satellite data to put some life cycle information on here, see how mature systems impact radiation versus developing. This is probably an early developing system. Um, and so this figure here just shows fairly simply uh, what the net radiative effect of these systems are as a function of the number of convective cores they have inside them. And the measurement of the number of convective cores really wasn't possible until we had radars in space. So another kind of new finding. Um, I also do some field work, um, and so I'll just briefly touch on this to complement what Angela had showed. Um, we have some le sort of less expensive precipitation sensors, something called the precipitation imaging package and the microrain radar which we've deployed in a number of different locations around the globe. And our focus has been primarily looking at cold season precipitation, like snow um, and very light rain. And these are results from another PhD student of mine, Julia Shades, um, a recent paper that we published looking at the different snowfall regimes that exist in Scandinavia. Um, you observe them at both of these sites, one in Norway and one in uh, northern Sweden, uh, where you can classify most of the events as either shallow deep, or what we call an intermittent regime, which is sort of an on-off um, bursts of snow that um, tend to be sort of intermediate in height, but also can uh, produce very intense amounts of snow for short periods of time. So again, we're doing some analysis of those regimes, what causes them, and what their impacts are. Um, I'll also very briefly go through this. This is NASA Energy and Water Cycle Study. Um, that have been part of for many years. Uh, here, we're using satellite observations to understand the components of Earth's energy balance. And I'm showing here just the uh, polar energy budgets in the north, uh, northern hemisphere, in the southern hemisphere, the Arctic and the Antarctic. Uh, won't go into the details here, other than to say that, um, again, that this is using state-of-the-art satellite observations to provide benchmarks for evaluating climate models. And the reason I accelerated through those couple of slides is because I did definitely wanted to highlight this one project now, which is now occupying a lot of my time. Um, this is the Polar Radiant Energy in the Far Infrared Experiment, or PREFIRE. Uh, this is a satellite mission that I'm leading, uh, funded by NASA. It's called the Earth Venture Instrument um, 
campaign. We're using, we're uh, working extensively with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, but also researchers at Colorado um, and Michigan, and Blue Canyon Technologies is building our CubeSats. And what's really exciting about this mission is that we're, we're going to be, for the first time, really mapping Earth's far infrared emission spectrum. The, about 50% or so of the energy that's emitted from uh, the top of the atmosphere on Earth actually occurs at wavelengths greater than 15 microns that have never really been systematically mapped, at least not spectrally mapped, around the globe. Um, and we're, so we're going to make this first of a lifetime sort of measurements. But not only that, we're going to do this using CubeSats, really inexpensive satellites about the size of a shoebox or a cereal box. Um, we're going to have two of those with the, an identical instrument um, in space at the same time flying in different orbits. And each one of the CubeSats will be able to map out this far infrared spectrum um, by itself together as they intersect over a certain area of the planet, but with a time difference between them, um, we'll actually be able to look at the processes that influence this far infrared radiation. And so again, uh, in, in sort of keeping with the theme of everything I do, our intention is to use this information to verify climate models and to try to improve the physics in the climate models to make sure the models are modeling the processes that govern these thermal fluxes uh, more accurately. So we have an explicit component of the project which involves both ice sheet models and climate models and we're going to try to incorporate these observations into those models and ultimately hopefully improve uh, climate projections. So again, just like Angela, I'm out of breath because that was a lot in a short period of time, but I don't think I have time for maybe one question or if not, I can hand it off to the next person. Is there any question? Uh, thank you, Professor Lickriot. Uh, uh, we have Professor Kelly Wagner. Can you can you hear me okay? Is this if it's muted, the hit the button on the top. Hello. There you go. Yeah. Hi. I collapsed. Um, let me try this again. So, like this? Hello? Uh, I'm just going to project. Um, okay, hi. Um, exciting to have you all here. I'm going to try and do a similar thing with Angela and Tristan. Um, I'm going to be breathless by the end of this. So, um, my name is Tell Wagner. I actually just joined this department about six months ago, so I've been here for a semester. Um, I'm originally from Europe, I grew up in Germany, I did my uh, undergrad and grad school in the UK, then spent five years in San Diego um, as a postdoc, then three years in North Carolina as a professor in, mostly in the department that was physics and physical oceanography, and so now I'm here. And um, so I'm a little bit, I come from a slightly different angle in many of these questions because my background is more oceanography and ice orientated than uh, from the atmosphere side. So, uh, some of you have seen this um, uh, schematic because this is the schematic I introduced when I uh, interviewed for this job. So, I apologize to my colleagues who already know this. Um, so, but I, I like it because it summarizes kind of what I do in my research. So, I work on three to a certain degree, distinct uh, method methodologies, theory, numerics, and observation. And I actually, my interests are, are quite varied within polar climate and ice studies. So my main, and that's why it sort of takes up the biggest part here, um, my main interest is polar climate modeling. And I try and span the spectrum from very idealized climate models that you can describe with a single ordinary differential equation and bridge the gaps all the way to global climate models and then try and also bring in observations. So I've worked with energy balance models, sea ice column models, and then bring them together to slowly try and increase that, that complexity. And then I've also done, I get the, the, the sense that we all try and do a little bit of field work when, when we can. And so I've been in the field a little bit and I sometimes also work with satellite output. 
that is a very different way of working with satellites than what Tristan does, who actually works with satellites. I just uh, sort of like, uh, you know, take advantage of, of the advances. Um, and the second thing that I'm really interested in is uh, glaciology. So I've worked on how to uh, model ice sheets and glaciers, especially how glaciers interact with the ocean and with the atmosphere. And then finally, I've also done a little bit of work, and this is linked to these observations, trying to bring in biological aspects and ice ecosystem interactions. I'm going to, for today, wanted to highlight two little vignettes. So one is a recent study that we did in my group um, on uh, sea ice climate modeling, and then briefly also mentioned something about the um, glaciology aspect. This is work that I'm sort of also looking forward to recruit graduate students to, to work on, right? So let me quickly introduce this idea. So the sea ice has decreased about 40% in its aerial cover over the last uh, 40 years or so. Yeah? So the sea ice aerial cover has shrunken from this level to what you can see here. Now, one thing that we're really interested in, in in my field is what impact does the actual loss of the sea ice have on the climate? So that is that is different than asking what impact does greenhouse gas, what impact does global warming have? What impact is just the removal of the sea ice? You can see that the top of the globe becomes much less white if you remove the sea ice, and that has an impact because it absorbs more heat into the into the system because the reflectivity here is lower. So we try and diagnose this using a couple of climate simulations. How would you do that? It's kind of clever. You first perform a global warming simulation, and you save the progression of the sea ice loss. Yeah, so you start out with our current sea ice cover, and then you warm the climate over the next 100 years or so, and you keep track of what the sea ice does. Now, you do a second simulation. In this simulation, you keep your greenhouse gases just as they are now, but you remove the ice as you go along. And the idea is, well, now you have a simulation that just removes the ice, but doesn't actually um, do any greenhouse effect. So that should give you the response of the climate to a, to a loss of sea ice. And so you have to look at what happens to the climate and that should give you the answer. The problem is that you can't just remove the ice. It's not that simple in a climate model to just take out the ice. Mm -hmm. So people have tried doing different things. You can either just apply a ghost flux that you invent, that you put in to move, remove the ice, the problem then is you're adding artificial heat. And that will have effects of warming, and they cannot be easily extracted from what's going on. Another way is to um, just nudge the ice. So in your model, you're actually just taking out the ice. The problem there is that you actually inject latent heat by doing that. And the third thing that people have tried is reduce the albedo. You artificially make the ice darker. The problem there is you're actually absorbing more energy into the system. The reason why I'm putting all these studies here is not because I expect you all to, you know, note them down now and go and read them, but the point is that there's been a lot of people working on this question. My claim now is that they're all wrong. <laughs> um, so this is um, work that makes me very popular within the community. <laughs> um, so I just talked to you through these issues, and for some reason or other, and I'm still not quite clear, these issues have not really been accepted or, or appreciated by the community. So there's a good, I don't know, 20 or 30 papers that all have that same, um, that same misconception. So what we've done is we've come up uh, we, we have an idealized climate model that I showed you earlier that is sort of your standard EBM with single column models um, representing the ice growth and melts at every, at every grid box. And that model, I can, I, I can isolate the effect from the, of the sea ice loss. 
And what I can show with this model is that in this model, if I do ghost flux or nudging or a albedo reduction, I actually overestimate the impact of sea ice loss by about 50 to 100 percent. Um, that is not to say that the couple models have exactly the same amount of overestimation. But the thing is, if that is an issue in an idealized climate model, you have to assume that it's also an issue in the uh, couple models. Um, we are battling reviewers in the Journal of Climate. It's been a long process. I've given this talk in the CPEP seminar a few months ago. That was the same state of battling reviewers, but what was it? So, um, the question is like, what is the real world? And that's a really tricky question. Um, and how bad are the couple of models in answering this question? So this is some of the science that I want to address. This is some of the, this gives you a flavor of the work that I do. Uh, most of the time it's not as negative as that. I try <laughs> not just say everyone else is wrong. I also try to come up with things that are uh, genuine and correct and right. Okay, then, good. So that was the first thing. And then just second, briefly, because I mentioned to you that I sort of do a bunch of different things. So this is sort of the sea ice climate modeling side of things that I do. Um, I also got really excited about what happens at the front of glaciers. So this represents the sort of a cross section of the glacier, and here's the front of the glacier interacting with the ocean. And the reason why I'm interested in this is um, partially motivated by pictures like this. You see these very, very distinct lines here? So this is an iceberg floating in the ocean. And these lines are melt incisions from the waves at the surface. So this iceberg gets melted at the wave line more than everywhere else, because waves are really efficient at eating away at an iceberg. And then the iceberg gets a little unstable, and it tips a bit, and then it gets, and then it has a new incision. So there's all these, yes. One moment, it's perfect because I'm almost done. But anyways, so you can see all these incisions. Now, on a global scale, um, they can be really important in how the stability of glaciers are affected, how ice shelves are impacted by melt from wave erosion. And so what we are planning on doing, and this is to use in the geosciences on the other side of the road, we have a wave tank in a freezer, which is kind of unique because you need a big freezer to be able to put a wave tank into there. And so this is Luke Zoth's lab, who's a professor in geoscience, and there you can see an ice block that is exposed to these wave, um, wave actions and wave melt. And then the part that I contribute is trying to understand from a theoretical point of view what, how that works and then taking that and putting it into a climate model. And so this is a, a collaboration with Luke Zoth in Geosciences and Nimish Pujara in Engineering. And we just heard that this will be funded or has been recommended for funding by the NSF. So I'm hoping to recruit a grad student who will spend many, many hours <laughs> freezing in a, in a way. <laughs> All right. So. If that's not compelling, I don't know what it is. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Wagner. Uh, next up, we have uh, Professor Elizabeth Manun. I thought you exact opposite prompt of everyone else and decided, let's just tell you a little bit about one thing I thought a lot about in the last year. Can y'all hear me in the back? Okay, and same thumbs up, so we're going to count that as good. Okay, I'm Elizabeth Maroon. I'm a professor here. I started the same semester as Angela Rao. I did my undergrad at MIT in Boston, went across the country entirely, Seattle, where I did my PhD and master at the University of Washington. From there, I moved back halfway across the country to CU Boulder, I did a postdoc, and then I was a research scientist then part before coming here. Uh, the research in my group is on three themes broadly. Thermohaline processes in the Atlantic, so basic oceanography of how, does, how do the different currents work together, what forces things. Second theme is climate change and variability. And third theme is how do we understand processes in the Atlantic Ocean and climate variability and climate change to improve predictions on climate time scales, seasons, to years, to decades. 
So those three things. So I was on the bike, you know, bike at home, trying to figure out, okay, what do I give on this flash talk? I can't just talk about everything I've been involved in the last year because I just can't. And no one wants to hear me talk about water mass conservation. So then I realized what I've been working on a lot in the last year is blobs. Cold blobs, warm blobs. So this is the tail of two blobs. <laughs> It was the warmest of blobs. <laughs> this is the 2014 North Pacific Rain Heat Wave, also known as, in the literature and in popular media, B blob, capitalized B blob. It was the coldest of blobs. This is the 2015 subpolar North Atlantic cold blob, um, usually called the cold blob, not you know an extreme. This was a near record event. I'll talk about it in more in a second. Why am I hyper focusing on these two blobs? Big question I have is how well can we predict oceanic extremes on seasonal, interannual, or even if possible longer time scales? Why do we care about oceanic extremes like these, the marine heat wave, this B blob or the cold blob? Because these are the kind of large events that have impact on ecosystems and on societies. So let's talk about the cold blob first. This cold blob affected teleconnections into Europe such that it had a driving influence on this, the heat wave that was going on at the same time. So the 2015 heat wave had a huge impact on society there. Without the cold blob, you wouldn't have had the teleconnection such that the heat wave even happened. Um, and why we also focused on this blob is that it was such an extreme event. This was like well above 95th percentile kind of extreme. It was not predicted by our climate prediction hindcast. Okay, a lot of words in there. What is a hindcast? A hindcast is a forecast that you're making, but in the past. So we already know what's happening. So we're going to run our climate model like a weather forecasting model, but we're going to start at some date in the past. So I use um, primarily the community earth system model, the Cato Prediction Large Ensemble, or the CSM CPLE. So what you do is you initialize this thing every year, 1954, let it go 10 years. Start again, 1955, let it go 10 years, and you have a huge ensemble of possible futures, but from the past, so hindcast. In orange here is the spread of year one forecast, or hindcast in orange. This gives you the whole 40 ensemble members, of possibilities. This solid line is the ensemble mean forecast, if you're using all of the 40 members. Black line is observations, blue, is what's known as the CSM large ensemble, which is what you could call an uninitialized counterpart to the CPLE. What that means is that that's just a normal climate projection. It only includes the impact of greenhouse gases, aerosols, volcanoes, all the forcing, but it doesn't include the actual state that your model is being initialized from. So when you add in, you know, where is the ocean? When you initialize the model, where is the atmosphere? All of those things. You can see that the black line and the orange line very well match each other. This is an example only in the subpolar North Atlantic. And this is somewhere where we have great skill in our climate prediction. And the reason why is the Atlantic Ocean circulation. Slow Atlantic Ocean circulation gives you, in the whole climate system, a path forward for predictability on five, ten year time scale. However, you'll notice there is one big event, one exception to the skill. CPLE, 2015. The subpolar North Atlantic, the black line is falling outside the spread of our hindcast prediction. It's only one year out, and it's happening in 2015, the subpolar North Atlantic. That's the gold block. So to try to improve the system for its, you know, next version, we want to understand what went wrong, or is this event just not predictable? Extreme events are hard to predict, and there's a reason they're extreme. Maybe we just don't have enough ensemble members. So since the last time I gave a flash talk, probably on the same topic, there has been a new data set with the Green Earth System model run in hindcast mode. Mild, seasonal to multi-year large ensemble. Initialized more frequently every three months. And now I'm showing you it for this cold blob event. Each line is one ensemble member, either in the DPLE or in Smile. Black line is observations for the cold blob. You will notice there's maybe only two ensemble members that gave you a reasonable prediction for this event. 
something is going on here. And it's worth trying to understand in CSM what went wrong, but not just CSM. Now I've got 12 different nine cats. Just repeat it. So we've got partners in the UK, partners in Europe, partners in Norway, France. We've got 12 different systems now, and you'll notice you know, there's very few ensemble members that capture the extremeness of the subfloor north of control block. And this, you know, you would expect there's two types of predictability. One is you hope that the ensemble mean from these initialized predictions would be following along the observations. None of them are doing that here. But the other piece you hope is that the spread, that all having all of those ensemble members, that if you had adequate spread, it would spread out enough to encompass this event. They're not really doing that either. So now it's time to think about, okay, what actually happened to this event? Should we have expected predictability in the first place? So this is just looking at the observations. What was what were the ingredients for this event? Atmospheric forcing played a key role. And it's the kind of atmospheric forcing that we may or may not have climate predictability for. So from January of 2015 and through, through April, the North Atlantic oscillation, which is just a measure of the jet, was at record positive high. We averaged over that DJFM period. It was the highest in the historic record. Why that's important for the ocean? When you've got strong winds, it takes away heat, pulls it off. Thing is, you also have deep mixed layers in the ocean in the wintertime. So what the, this very strong NAO did was it sustained the already cold anomaly that you had there, kept it going. So that by the summertime, when mixed layers shallow, it just took a little bit of a wimpy cooling, you know, 10 watt per meter squared. It's not that huge, really. But when your mixed layer is shallow, it's really easy to heat to cool down that entire layer really fast. And so the cold block really dropped down from May through July. That's when the event peaked. Should we have expected predictability of either of these two ingredients? Some people say with the wintertime NAO, we do have one to two year predictability a little bit that we might have been able to. Some studies suggest it. What about this kind of summertime, a little bit of surface heat flux cooling? Yeah, I don't think you have predictability on that. You would hope that maybe the spread in our ensemble members would be able, be able to capture that. They didn't really. Um, and maybe that's where we should be focusing our effort. So this is an ongoing story. I'm finishing this one up, looking at all of these different models, trying to figure out, you know, which of these different hind tests have good initializations. Are there any commonalities? You know, which ones did well at the NAO, which ones did well in summer, or is this just not something we should have expected predictability on? So before I exit, we're going to talk about the warmest of the blobs. And this is some of the work um, that Evan Meekers and my group is working on as well as looking at Luann Thompson. We're also thinking about, is this event predictable? So 2013, 2014, 2015, again, we had another mostly atmosphere or oceanic extreme. This one had a lot of impacts on ecosystems in the region. There were lots of sad little marine animals. So, you know, looking at clams, um, oysters, things that are very important for the fisheries uh, industry out there. But this event, while it probably does have interactions with El Nino Southern Oscillation, which would be a source of predictability, because we do expect that um, systems such as the Tatal Prediction Large Ensemble have two-year predictability, this was also a largely atmosphere forced event. Um, atmosphere forcing, you know, we weakened in this case atmosphere forcing. Yeah, uh, you're going to get less cooling in this region. So this is a story. Stay continued, uh, be continued. Uh, but that was my tale of two blogs. Happy to take some questions. Yeah, we can have one quick question. The full blog, does it have anything to do with the AMOS? Ah, good question. Yes and no. So, <laughs> in the subpolar North Atlantic, one of the impacts we expect from a weakening AMOS is what's called the warming pole. 
AMOX slows down, you have less ocean heat convergence in that region, so you get cooling. Is the AMOX slowing down now is a very controversial topic. We don't have long enough observational records to say or not. We expect that climate variability is probably in the um, correct phase to give you maybe 0.1 degree Kelvin at the cooling in the cold log region. However, the pattern is not the same as the cold log, and the cold log got to a depth of one degree. So that's probably part of part of the story, but not the whole story. Um, the atmosphere forcing was really the key bit for this, and that atmosphere forcing probably is not influenced by the ocean circulation. Okay, so you don't think the AMOC is a big factor? Not in this one. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, it's time to Professor Maroon once again. Uh, oh. We have uh, Professor Stephanie Henderson. Or am I... You were if it's green, you're on. I'm good. Okay. Yep. I'm sure, there'll be like auto muting between every. <laughs> um. Okay. So hi everybody. If I can find a. Okay. Hello. I mean, pants are kind of a joke when it comes to talking. <laughs> um. All right. Can everybody hear me? Okay. All right. Um. So I'm Stephanie Henderson. I'm an assistant professor here. Um. A little bit of my background, I, like several of our faculty members, um, I uh, went to graduate school at Colorado State University, um, and then I did my postdoc here, actually, so it was really nice to get to know everybody before uh, uh, signing up for, for this job. Um, it did not sway me, so clearly it was uh, a good thing that, uh, um, um, to have that, had that experience. Um, and then I, I started here in the fall of 2019, so I had one normal semester before COVID hit. So really nice. Sorry to all of the other new faculty who have not had this great event. So similar to Liz, um, I am decided to focus on only one project. Um, so first, I'll kind of give a little bit of an overview about what I do. A lot of my work deals with tropical and subtropical interactions. Um, I largely look at um, large-scale waves, known as Rossby waves. Um, especially those associated with the Madden Julian Oscillation and with the El Nino Southern Oscillation. So I look a lot at subseasonal to seasonal variability and uh, the Madden Julian Oscillation, the MJO, is a large source of, of, of subseasonal to seasonal variability. It gives us a lot of predictability. Um, and one of the things that I'm really interested in is um, understanding MJO teleconnections and their variability, um, how different teleconnections interact with each other uh, so, for example, during El Nino events, uh, you get all sorts of really fun uh, changes to MJO teleconnections. They get you, they shift. Uh, you get teleconnection interference, which I'll talk a little bit about here, uh, between the teleconnection patterns. Uh, so I'll, I'll just go through this and kind of show you. Um, I decided to, to pick a project. Um, I cheated a little bit because this involves two faculty members here. Um, this is work that uh, I did with uh, Professor Dane Baimon here, uh, as well as our collaborator Matt Newman. And um, in this work, what we did is we used something known as linear inverse modeling, um, which I'll talk a little bit about in a moment, to diagnose what leads to a Pacific North American pattern. So this is, or known as a PNA pattern. So here I'm showing one phase of the PNA pattern. This is showing upper level. Uh, stream function, um, which is, you know, you can think of it like pressure anomalies. Um, so you have, you know, a low, a high, a low, and a high. It's this kind of quadrature uh, wave train that develops. And it has really significant impacts on, on our weather here in the U.S. Um, it's influenced by both the MJO and ENSO, so I was naturally really interested in it. And we used uh, linear inverse modeling or LIM to try to understand the processes that can lead to a PNA pattern. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, linear inverse modeling, and I'm going to talk about it mostly in kind of a conceptual way, but I did throw one equation in here just to give you a sense of what LIM does. Um, so what LIM does is, let's say that you have some data, which we call X. Uh, for this paper, this included tropical sea surface temperatures, uh, a, a Eating, which uh, say, essentially tells us about convection, where the convection is in the tropics, so that'll capture MJO and ENSO um, 
and then extratropical spring function, which will capture the PNA pattern in, in its evolution. So that's what goes into X here. And what this, what the limb does is it assumes that the evolution of X in time can be separated into two components. So the predictable component and the unpredictable component. So this, uh, the predictable dynamics here are determined through the variability statistics of the data. So essentially what we do is we ask, how do all of these variables um, vary with each other at, different la at, a, at a certain lab? Um, so that tells us about the statistics and kind of what's predictable and captured by the statistics. And then you have the noise, which is the part that's not predictable. Uh, for this part, we just focus on the predictable statistics. Uh, so this is what we kind of use. And now I'm just going to talk about what we do and what's kind of cool about linear inverse modeling um, that's really unique to it. And I'm going to use kind of a, a simple analogy that most people are familiar with, which is when you think about a forecast. Right? So when you think about a forecast, what you're doing is, you know, you, you start with some initial condition at time zero. And in case of like a, a statistical model, you, you know, based on the predictable dynamics of the system, you know, you end up at some final condition at time equals whatever days, right? So you're going forward in time from an initial time. That's what a forecast does. One of the really cool things that you can do with linear inverse modeling or, or LIM, which is what we do in this, in this work, is you can go backwards. So you can say, let's say that I want a very specific final condition. In our case was the PNA pattern. We wanted to understand what led to the PNA pattern. So based on the dynamics of the system, based on the statistics of the data, you can go backwards in time to ask the question, what will optimally get me to that final condition? So this is kind of one of the really fun things that you can do with LIM and what we did in this paper. There's a lot of other fun things you can do with LIM. And I'll, and I'll, I'll mention that a little bit, maybe if we have time. Um, so these are just some of the results we saw. So here's our final condition. You can see the final PNA pattern here in the upper level string function. And this is the optimal initial condition in the string function, which is kind of hard to tell what's going on right now, right? So, so you can see some kind of weak anomalies. You can see, you know, some anticyclonic anomalies in the Pacific. We can look at its evolution over the 15 days, right? You see this kind of retrograding um, anticyclone, uh, which becomes part of a final PNA pattern, for example. Uh, but what I found really interesting in this work was when we looked at what was going on in the tropics. Now, this is a time longitude plot. So here's time moving forward um, on the y-axis and longitude on the x-axis. So what we found is that what optimally leads to a PNA pattern is when you had this is a tropical heating and SSTs in the, in the uh, contours there. So here you can see a persistent pattern, something that persists for the entire 90 days. This is during the winter, so the whole winter season, you had this persistent SSP, these are the temperatures and convection that's associated with them. So, and you also have this, this sloped um, anomaly here, which um, is propagating eastward in time, which is associated with MJO. So what we found is that um, the optimal way to get to a PNA pattern is when you have both an MJO and an MSO event occurring at the same time. And so there's not much time. I won't show my, my other two slides, but what we essentially found is that ENSO, because it's persistent, it persists for an entire winter season, it'll force a particular teleconnection pattern. So for example, during La Nina, um, it will force a cyclonic anomaly over the North Pacific. Depending on what the MJO is doing, because the MJO forces its own teleconnection patterns, and those teleconnection patterns change as the MJO propagates eastward. So during the early phases of the MJO, these teleconnection patterns tend to be of the opposite sign of those during La Nina. So they will have, they will cancel each other out, largely cancel each other out. There's none of these sort of interference. So this will minimize that initial condition, which is why this was so weak because you get that cancellation between the teleconnection patterns, and as the MJO evolves eastward, this will evolve to constructive interference, such that the MJO is forcing the same sign to the connection pattern as ENSO. This will amplify the response, and you get a rapid growth in the unit. Um, so I'll stop here, um, and uh, this is a little bit of work that we do here. Um, Dan also works a lot with LIM, the Linear Universe Modeling, which is kind of why 
thought it would be fun to, to share some of this today. Um, but yeah, I'd be happy to take any questions. If anybody has any. I'll make sure John is kind of chat. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Professor Henderson. So uh, next we have uh, Professor John Martin. He will go a little bit over time, but I hope everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks everybody. I'm not gonna use the mic. I think you can hear me. Um, I've been interested recently in the interannual variability of the Northern Hemisphere circulation in the, the winter to spring transition, occasioned by uh, having paid attention over the last number of years to the transition from the summer to the fall, which is influenced by uh, tropical cyclones recurving forward. So there's a diabetic agent that sort of does some of that transition and differentiates between one season and the other. And I think there's something akin to that going on in this transition, and I want to convince you of that. This is work that's still in the shed. So I'm kind of, you know, some of my colleagues have walked out on the fashion runway and advertised some really interesting things that are kind of well thought out. I'm walking the plank. I don't know if this is, they look the same, but they don't feel the same. I don't know if that's really going to go anywhere. But anyway, let me tell you what I'm thinking. Here is the situation in the polar night. There's land or ice, there's stratus clouds at low elevation. Those cool all through the winter night because there's no radiation coming in except the little bit that comes down in the infrared, but the stratus clouds are cooling. Above that cooling max, you can drag the PV down from the tropopause, and you create these little potential vorticity anomalies at high latitude in the Arctic night. And they might look like this, the collection of these, and they're called tropopause polar vortices. This was first labeled, I think, by Steve Cavallo, but it was first discovered by the collaboration of Greg Hakem and Steve Cavallo when Cavallo was a graduate student at Washington. Now he's a professor at OU. And um, so you might have in the Arctic night a collection of these TPVs. They're little local depressions in the tropopause, and so they're upper uh, positive vorticity anomalies is what they really are. Occasionally, in the wintertime flow, a 500 millibar streamline, like in this case, a big high amplitude ridge over the western part of the North American continent, might come up and make contact with one of these things and drag it into the extratropical uh, flow. Uh, otherwise, they're sitting there at high latitude and they have long life cycles. When the sun comes up, these things that are not connected into the mid-latitude flow, the rest of these TPVs, are at risk of diabetic annihilation because mm -hmm. the sun rises and start, they start to get heated instead of, if they're not growing anymore by cooling beneath, the heating's occurring beneath them. So they might disappear. And it made me think, is there differences from year to year at this time of year, you know, right now, mid-February to mid-March, where these otherwise orphaned TPVs, might, they'll just decay away when the sun comes up, how can you get them out of the high Arctic? And do you get them out with greater efficiency in some seasons than in other seasons? And does that export uh, have an influence on the storminess that you see in the spring? Because not every March and April is the same in the mid-latitudes. Some of them are exceptionally stormy. Some of them are boring, and you get a really nice, smooth transition to the warm season. Uh, that's partly anecdotal. So how do you measure the storminess? Well, if you're me, <laughs> you do it in a simple-minded way, because I don't have all any of those other skills. But this is what I thought. Here's an annual. It's 25 degrees to 65 degrees. Focus on the mid-latitudes. Just calculate the aerial extent of 1,000 millibar heights below several thresholds, starting at 996 millibars, which is equivalent to minus 32 meters, all the way to 972, which is the equivalent of minus 224. Then you've got seven categories. You can measure the aerial extent in all seven of those categories for every day. You can take an average for every season. Then you can use like an MVP voting. Um, how many seasons or how many of these categories get you to the top of the list, how many of them are at the bottom of the list, and that's how you can categorize the season. Here's the average from the NSEP reanalysis for three of those thresholds, 996 millibars from December 1st to the end of April, 984, 972. So this is two, minus 224, forget off the top of my head, and this is minus 32. Um, then what you do is you just superimpose a given year from February 15th to March 15th, time series of that, add up all the perturbations, and you can categorize a stormy year or a, a less than normal stormy year. And when you do that, this is what you find out. So February 15th to March 15th, these are the five stormiest years in the NSEP reanalysis, and these are the five least stormy years. So here's the difference in sea level pressure between the stormiest and least stormy years, measured February 15th to March 15th. These are every four millibars, so you have four, eight, 12, 16, 20, minus 24 millibars, a really robust dilution low 
in stormy springs compared to normal. And maybe a weaker Icelandic low, although I don't really know what the climb low is there. So it's a little bit weaker. And these signals are equivalent barotropic. This is 500 millibars. You have potential height differences from the same differencing. And uh, so you've got a, a really elongated troughiness uh, in the North Pacific, ridginess over, uh, over Hawaii, and some ridginess through the cold corridor of North America. Okay, so they look kind of same. If you think about this height field, it's not surprising that you get this difference field in the 300 millibar wind speeds. So these are every 10 meters per second. You get a 30 meter per second extended jet in the Pacific in stormy years. And you get the uh, parallel weakening over here. And not much different in the North Atlantic, and a little bit different over the Gulf of Mexico. This is the thing that's really caught my eye. Because what if you could inject some of these wintertime TPVs that, again, otherwise are at risk of annihilation? How would be an efficient way to inject them into the mid-latitude flow? Get them into this extended jet. So here's the March TPV probability anomalies. This is from Steve. So the positive uh, warm colors indicate positive anomalies. That means it's more likely than not that in March you see TPVs in these locations. It's less likely you see them here. So that's what it looks like in March, right in the middle of the window that I've just painted for you. Now I'm going to superimpose, and they occur around 500 millibars. So the tropopause is lower in the Arctic. So now I'm going to put on top the 500 millibar height anomalies again, put on this different map. Son of a gun. It looks like there might be a pathway out of the Arctic in one of the high population regions and another one here. And so here's one of them, a pathway for TPVs out of the Arctic in a stormy year and into the extraordinary Pacific jet. So this is an injection of these things into the mid-latitude bloodstream, if you will, that occurs uh, preferentially in stormy February 15th to March 15th. And then another one here that's not quite as dramatic comes through the central United States and maybe hits that slightly stronger subtropical jet down in the Gulf of Mexico. So anyway, I want to investigate this more. I want to know something more about what is the exact distribution of these? Is it really true that in these years that have this characteristic difference field, you end up with a stormy or March in April? Is that really true? And if it is, is this one of the main mechanisms that does that? So as I said, I'm sort of just rolling this thing out of the garage right now. It's, you know, it's the leaking oil, there's a flat tire. But there's something interesting here, I think, that um, can be attacked. So maybe we'll do that in the next couple of years. So thanks. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Martin. Uh, let's have a round of applause for all the faculty members. Yeah, so we'll uh, stop here for today. Feel free to reach out to all the faculty members if you have any follow-up questions uh, for the prospective students. We also have another faculty flash talk session on March 4th. So uh, if you are interested in hearing from the other five faculty members, uh, be sure to tune into our YouTube page. It would be live streamed there, so you can uh, hear from other faculty members as well. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Yeah.